reconnect and heal today. Welcome to Love Never Dies with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Love Never Dies Radio on Dream Vision 7 Radio Network that broadcasts in 136 countries and Dr. Turndorf, Turn on the Love on Binge Networks TV. And we're also live streaming on YouTube. So I wonder if you are wondering how men and women differ in the love department. And I bet you are wondering, it's a perennial question that people ask me. And today we're gonna to talk about how you can tell whether you and your heartthrob are compatible or just enjoying good chemistry. We're gonna find out what dating means to men versus women, how a woman with high standards can succeed in finding the right love partner, and what does a happy relationship even look like? So I wanna introduce you to a really great guy. I've had him on the show before. His name is Evan Mark Katz. And he and I are gonna be discussing the differences between men and women in the love department and how you can succeed in the game of love. He is billed as the personal trainer for smart, strong, successful women. He's a dating coach and he's been helping single women since 2003. He's the author of four books, most recently, Believe in Love, and he's been featured in hundreds of media outlets, including Today, The New York Times, and CNN. And since 2015, Evan's blog has over 30 million readers. His podcast has over 1 million downloads, and 12,000 women have graduated from Love You and his six-month video course that helps women understand the parameters of the love scene and how to find love. And uh, he's very happily married. He lives in LA with his wife and their two kids, evanmarkkatz.com and evanmarkkatz.com dating. Well, without further ado, let's say hello to my friend, Evan Mark Katz. Hello, welcome back. Thank you for having me back, Jamie. It's such a pleasure to be here. I love having you. So, you know, before we went live, I said, I wanna know how you got into this. And you said to me, I don't think anybody wants to know that. I think they, that the people want to just know, what can I do to have a more successful love life? But I still want to know. Um, the short version of how I became, I guess, one of, if not the first specific dating coach. I mean, there were plenty of therapists, but there was never anybody who specialized in this back in 2003. It was sort of accidental, kind of opening doors and seeing where they led. I, I came to Hollywood when I was 24 to be a screenwriter. Um, I did some pretty cool things. I finished third in Project Greenlight with Matt Damon and Ben Affleck when I was 27 years old and agents and managers. I came really close, but I never actually was successful. I could never make a living. So I went to film school um, so I could get a degree, teach screenwriting or something like that. And while I was there, I needed a day job. Turns out my day job was answering phones at JDate, the Jewish online dating site in Beverly Hills. Literally was tempting next door, said, hey, I'll do anything. Got a job getting yelled at by strangers. And after nine months of that, I realized I knew more about online dating by virtue of dating online, using the product and talking to people on the phone than a lot of people. So I combined the two things that I did relatively well, which was to write and to date. <laughs> and um, wrote a book about online dating in 2003 that unlike my Hollywood career did well. Um, and I dropped out of film school and became like the online dating guy. I started writing people's online dating profiles one at a time for $99 a pop. Uh, my business was called e Cyrano. And then online dating profiles led to online dating coaching. Oh my God, I'm getting all this attention. What do I do now? So I go online, go on match and help people flirt. What do I do now? I mean, you don't know how to, you really don't know how to do this? A lot of people don't really struggle with this. And so I slowly developed a suite of services to meet the needs of my clients. And, you know, 17 years into this, I've refined it to the point where I've got this, this course called Love You that helps smart, strong, successful women understand men, date, uh, and make healthy relationship choices that can last a lifetime. So it was, uh, it was again, sort of an accidental thing that I kept on building upon. And, and uh, you know, what was originally just not a lark, um, became like a, a, a passion. It became my everything. So I'm very lucky that I get to do this. Uh, don't have certainly the credentials that a, that a psychologist has. I just have nearly two decades of experience of, of helping women. That's the best. So, you know, it's funny because they, 
they always say, you always hear women say, uh, well, I'm so educated, I'm intelligent, I'm this, I'm that. Uh, I have to hide myself. I can't be authentic because I'll threaten men. Women believe this, the smart, sexy, successful women. And in fact, after my husband left his body from the bee sting and I was with him for you know, almost 30 years, my mother said, if you ever hope to marry again, make sure you don't talk. <laughs> So uh, I guess there's uh, some some old school wisdom. Um, I think everything is in bal a balance and I think everything involves trade-offs and people don't want to talk about trade-offs. We all can understand the trade-offs we make when it comes to work. Right? You may have a job that you're really passionate about, but you're underpaid. Or you have a job that you're really passionate about uh, and you're compensated well, but the hours are really long or you don't like the people you work with or there's a glass ceiling or you don't have as much creative control. So whatever you do in life, there's trade-offs. There's trade-offs with your home. There's trade-offs with your family and your friends. The one thing we don't want to make any trade-offs on is love. We think we could just get someone with all good qualities and no bad qualities. That doesn't exist. So what I try to help people do is understand which qualities you can and can't trade off on. Because I could hand you or any of my clients, the top chef, supermodel, Rhodes Scholar guy who does triathletes on the side. But he's probably too busy for you. He's probably a narcissist, a perfectionist. He's probably critical. You may not want to settle down with one person. It often comes with the territory with someone who is so driven and demanding and busy. And it doesn't mean he's a bad person. He may not be a good partner. And so if you keep on pounding your head against that wall, there's only one person for me, right? And it's the guy who's taller, richer, smarter than I am. We, we're left with a really, really small dating pool. Right? That small dating pool, half of them don't want you. And then the people who do want you, actually you have too much in common and then there's a lot of friction. Not too much in common, too many uh, personality traits. Two people who are really busy don't make for a great fit. People, two people who are very um, opinionated or difficult don't always make for a great fit. So once we recognize this is not about personal, it's not about right or wrong, it's about what works, right? We're just trying to create systems that work based on real life practical compatibility things that people don't always pick up when they're going on an app looking for the, the cutest, tallest, richest guy. So it's interesting because you're talking about if someone is like you, you may not be compatible. So I guess we have to make the distinction between like you in terms of personality versus like you in terms of lifestyle. So, because we know that uh, the matching principle, the more similar you are in terms of tastes, values, religious, political, sexual values, those kinds of similarities, being like you in those ways make for greater compatibility. But you're talking about a different kind of like you, like if somebody is working like you are. Or I'm gonna I'm gonna slightly push back, which is not to say that I, I inherently disagree. It's certainly easier theoretically, if I'm Jewish and you're Jewish, to say oh, we're gonna raise our kids Jewish and it's one less thing to worry about. But I'll also say definitively that there's very little practical evidence that just because two people are Jewish that they're gonna have a happy marriage, right? Similarity is not compatibility. It's just not, right? I've never met a man, like I'm doing my fantasy football draft tonight. I've never met a man who's like, my wife has to be into fantasy football, ever, ever. Yeah. And so, and so, is, yeah, okay. so, so to me, we seek similarity. And similarity has virtually no bearing on what actually determines whether we get along, which is, has so many variables, right? And again, you, you know them from, from having worked with people. How do you handle conflict, right? What is your sex drive? Are you introverted? Are you extroverted? Well, do you like spazing, back, saving or spending? Well, These things have well, nothing to do with that. Because if my drive is really low and yours is high, we are too dissimilar and that makes for incompatibility. Right, but, no, but you can't go on a dating app and look for a sex drive. Like, you, what do we look for when you go on? Height, weight, age, education, income, none yeah. of which determine whether you're going to be compatible. None. none, none. But if you're not similar enough in the areas that count, you're going to always be in conflict. Like, we, are, we could be both be Jewish but if our values, I mean, if one is a Hasidic Jew and one is a liberal Jew, we, we're not similar enough in any way that we're going to be fighting about everything. But, but that's, that's why I discourage people from focusing on those things, from those external things, 
what matters, at least in my opinion, right? Reasonable people can disagree. And you, don't, you did couples counseling. It doesn't matter what you're back. How do you get along? Does it work? My wife and I couldn't be less similar from our backgrounds. That's the point, right? That's the whole point is we're one hell of a couple. But on paper, we don't look at all similar. There's something in that to look at. It's interesting. So, you know, it's funny because I remember my husband saying uh, liberal Jews and devout Catholics are the most similar in terms of their view of the world, their values. Interesting. Because I there this is such a, a, a hornet's nest, really, because we values are so important because so many couples fight around dissimilar values. Well, I truly believe that you should clean the house and finish all your chores before you play. Well, I believe that you should uh, play before you do your chores. These kinds of dissimilar values make for constant friction. So, so, so let, me, let me find a, a place where we can 100% agree. That, that is true, zero disagreement there. The problem is people are not going on dating apps looking for, does, does this person agree with me about when children should play? We are, we are driven by attraction first. Absolutely. And attraction at best is limited in predicting your future happiness. Very limited. That's the problem is that people don't know the right questions to ask. They don't know what to look for. So you go, you, you know, they say men fall in love with the eyes and women fall in love with the ears, right? I, I'm going to push back on that too, but go on. Go ahead. But the, but the idea is you're not even asking the right questions. You don't know what to look at. Just because you have chemistry doesn't mean you're compatible. Right. And so I wouldn't even think of it in terms of questions, one may, um, I, I think of when you say, well, what are we looking for? Maybe you could disagree with this, but I, I love this. I tell all my clients by the time they end, finish love you, you're looking for five, five things to start. If you don't have these five things, nothing else matters. Kindness, consistency, communication, commitment, character. That's fantastic. That is and, and if you have a guy who is a six foot four Catholic who likes skiing, who makes $250,000 a year, if he's not communicative, if he doesn't want to commit, it doesn't matter how attracted you are or what you have in common. So we need to get these conditions met. Everything else is a bonus. It would be easier if my wife had a trust fund. That would be great. It would be easier if we had the same background, but the fact that we don't doesn't undermine the relationship. But the things I talked about are the relationship. It's how you treat each other. That's fantastic. I like what you're saying because these are really traits of character. These are like traits of character that are essential building blocks. Inte you know, it's an, there's integrity factors because who cares? Like you said, we have the same religion or we earn a similar amount. But if you don't have character, if you, you know, my contractor who, who's working in my house, he made a big mistake. I came out of session and he said, I made a mistake that a child would have made. That's character, you know, where a month before a, a contractor here made a mistake and he started screaming at me, you know, like, why are your jobs so hard? I'm like, dude, you're dumping on me, your mistake. So those two, night and day, different character traits. All right, right, right. So the problem is we can't tell these deeper things, how we, how people treat each other for a couple of years. And people are looking for answers right away. They want to know, is this person my guy? I don't want to waste time. I don't want to get hurt. Now, that's and you point. cannot figure this stuff out from a profile, from a first date, from your first month. You can't figure it out. You can get an inkling, but you don't know what someone's made of until that initial chemistry wears off for the most part. You know, it's also interesting because you know how they used to say, you know, in back in the olden days, don't consummate the relationship, meaning don't have sex until all other aspects of the relationship are in place. In the olden days, people didn't even have sex till they were married, till they had everything else secure. Once you have sex and all those sex chemicals start flowing, your brain isn't even thinking straight. So now you're overlooking your warning signs. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't like what I'm seeing here, but oh my God, he, he gives me good oral sex. You know, so you're not thinking straight. So I always, I read an, um, 
decades ago. It was a research published in the New York Times. The people who waited four months before having sex had better uh, long-term relationships and marriages because obviously they got to know the person better and felt more secure in who the person is, but even in four months. Right, and so, and so we as professionals who are, who are giving advice have to give people advice that they can follow that's reasonable, that works in the real world. So I think we could say in one breath, yes, uh, waiting to figure out what kind of person you have on your hands before you get sexually involved with them is a good idea. But not and ma making up some sort of four month arbitrary timeline is not going to be very effective in, in the real world. Right. So where I land, where, where, I, where I teach women and love you and love you is just a system. Just right. First month is on confidence and then meeting men, dating, understanding men, relationships and commitment. We just walk people through what are the best decisions to make based on reality. So we talk about the concept called sex exclusivity. Don't sleep with a guy unless he's your boyfriend. That's it's it's easier than making up a number of dates, a number of weeks. It's not an arbitrary timeline. It's I'm not going to get involved with someone or call them a boyfriend or sleep with them until I know that I could feel safe sleeping with him and, and know he's going to call me the next day. And that might take place. That might take place at three and a half weeks. So that, that might take place. Means, that boyfriend means he's my bo exclusive partner. It, it not just exclusive, not sleeping with other people. He's but my, my boyfriend. boyfriend. The, ti the title matters. Exclusive. A guy could say, I'm not sleeping with anybody else, but it doesn't mean he wants to be with you and escalate. Boyfriend is with the intention of looking towards a future and kind of making that commitment. It's turning a corner, taking your profile down, Definitely. focusing on each other. And so I basically tell women, you're the CEO of your love life. Men are interns applying for a job with you. And you have to vet the intern and hire slowly and fire quickly. And so we see how a man reveals himself over a month. A lot of times, not always, and sometimes the guy doesn't reveal himself for a year, but a lot of times you'll get, you'll get information within that first month that will let you know, not that he's your soulmate, but that he's definitely not. So I'm really big on dating with frequency and having a quick trigger okay. finger. I like that. I, yeah. Also, you know, they say that the unconscious knows within the first three minutes everything you need to know, but people don't necessarily register what the unconscious is telling them. And women will often dismiss their instincts, right? It's like, I'm getting a vibe, this guy's a runner. I'm getting a vibe, this guy is a commitment foe. Believe what your first messages tell you. Right? right. There's something, there's a, a book on my bookshelf, it's Gavin De, De Becker, The Gift of Fear. And it really talks about how we have, we all have a, um, acquired pattern recognition where if something seems off, listen to it. And, that, and that's, that's actually a strangely powerful message to women. Women are considered more intuitive feeling creatures, and yet they're more likely to ignore their own emotions. And so what we talk about is pay attention to those emotions, especially the negative emotions. Anxiety is a bad sign. But a lot of people, because they associate love with anxiety, right? Anxious attachment style, we associate the butterflies and the nervousness and obsession, right? We associate that with love. Love is a much safer, more consistent, almost familial feeling that a lot of women don't even know that's what love is. It's calm. That's right. That's very true. Very true. And you express it well. So, you know, also you can get a clue about uh, how a man is going to treat you by how he feels about his mom. If that man loves his mom and he really has an affection for her and women, that's a much better bet than a guy who hates his mother. You know, that to me is a red flag. And another one is, and women don't always pay attention to this. Tell me what you think of this. The guy, when he explains his exes, it was always her fault, her problem. He never says, you know, what I did in this relationship that didn't work well, or my role in the demise, if I don't hear that, I'm nervous. Because that means when I get into an argument with you, it's going to be my fault. I, I, I get that. And I could, I could give you the yes, yes and, right? Like, I wouldn't disagree with the broad stereotypical assertions. I wouldn't take that as gospel. 
because you're going to get a lot of false positives that way. You're, I mean, well, that's the, if he likes his mom. No, no, you're going to get a, a false positive. Is there, there's someone who hates his mom who's a great guy? Oh, definitely. Because his mom was in this case, his mom or his girlfriend was actually terrible. That that actually happens. It happens. And, well, and in, and in telling reverse, me five different women. All, you know, I get suspicious if every ex, it was all her fault and I'm innocent, that would alarm me. I, I completely get it. Just know I coach women. And you can only imagine that if, if I'm a dating coach for smart, strong, successful women, wouldn't you think that most of them are going to come to me and tell me what's wrong with men? You betcha. And I don't think that they're irredeemable because they've gone out with a lot of shitty guys. So, I mean, sometimes it, sometimes it's an accurate portrayal. Now she may, she may be responsible for choosing those guys and not being able to break the chain. That's a but, whole other thing. But all I'm saying is if I don't hear any personal responsibility, like what you just said, well, I have a pattern. I choose these types. There's some responsibility in that, right? but not I'm an innocent bystander. They all are this way. They all cheat on then I'm suspicious. So we're, we're, we're looking for self-awareness. Right. Right. And, and, and I agree with you. It's what I look for in clients. If, if you think that the whole world's conspiring against you, there has to be some measure of responsibility. Not in, hey, I've had 10 guys cheat on me. The cheating is on them. Why do you keep choosing cheaters is on you. Yes. So we're not defending the, the bad behavior. Right. It's, it's, it's how. How, how are you so blind or right. driven by a certain sort of subconscious attraction that you keep on landing in the same right. place? Right. right, that's a good distinction. Let's take a quick break. We'll be back in a moment, sure. okay? It's Dr. Jamie Turndorf here, and I have a question for you. Are you or someone you love a veteran suffering from undiagnosed PTSD? According to statistics, between 100 and 200,000 vets suffer PTSD. But did you know that there's an arbitrary diagnostic loophole that denies the PTSD diagnosis to vets who suffer a coexisting mental health disorder? Meanwhile, according to the British Psychiatric Journal, it is rare for vets to suffer PTSD without a coexisting mental health disorder. This means that millions of vets with PTSD don't even know they have it and aren't getting treatment for it. Read my new column, Winning the War on PTSD, in mastersofhealthmag.com and discover a cutting-edge, research-backed new solution to PTSD that you've never heard about. The exciting news is this solution is free for vets with PTSD. Go to mastersofhealthmag.com, take my free PTSD quiz right away, and start your healing journey today. Wishing you all the love in this world and beyond. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf. Love Never Dies is now on the Dream Vision 7 radio network every Wednesday and Thursday at 1 p.m. and 1 a.m. Eastern Time. Dr. Jamie Turndorf, also known as Dr. Love, is the number one international best-selling author of Love Never Dies, How to Reconnect and Make Peace with the Deceased. If you're grieving the loss of a loved one, tune in and find out how to reconnect and heal any unfinished business using Dr. Turndorf's groundbreaking new Dialoguing with the Departed technique. Visit AskDrLove.com to find out more. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow. You're listening to Love Never Dies with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. If you yearn to get along better with your life partner or spouse, friends, family members, and even co-workers, Dr. Turndorf's book, Kiss Your Fights Goodbye, Dr. Love's 10 Simple Steps to Cooling Conflict and Rekindling Your Relationship shows you how to turn conflict into connection for a lifetime of lasting love. 
Find out more about Kiss Your Fights Goodbye at AskDrLove.com. This is Love Never Dies with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. This show is for you, the listener. Once again, here's Dr. Turndorf. Hello again. Welcome back to Love Never Dies Radio on Dream Vision 7 Radio Network and Dr. Turndorf Turn on the Love on Binge Networks TV. We're talking with Evan Mark Katz, the wonderful relationship coach for smart, strong, successful women. And he's been doing it since 2003. He's an author. He uh, is the founder of Love You, his website, Evan Mark Katz. And then the other website is evanmarkkatz.com forward slash dating. So we're back. We're back. (laughs) Would you like to talk about how a woman can tell whether she has chemistry or compatibility? Um, I think it's kind of where we, where we started today. Um, yeah, where, where chemistry, as you know, is this very instant visceral thing that you feel. Um, uh, we, we often think of it as an, uh, as an unalloyed good. It's it, it, like chemistry in and of itself is everything. That's why there's some match.com and an off-brand called chemistry. People love chemistry because it is a drug. It's dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine, right? These are the, the, the pleasure centers that light up in your brain, which is similar to be on coke or meth when you feel that thing. The problem is when you feel that thing, you don't always see things clearly. You sweep bad behavior under the rug. You accept less from someone, all because you want another hit of the drug. And so it's not that the drug itself is bad. It's that it skews your thinking and it allows you to stay in relationships where you're not getting your emotional needs met. So in Love You, we say, and again, I'm quoting from other people, and there's an Alison Armstrong out there who talks about when you find a 10 in chemistry, run in the opposite direction. It's not that chemistry is bad. It's that sometimes you can't see clearly, and sometimes it's easier to have a healthy relationship when you can relax, let down your guard, be yourself. And that's usually not with the 10 plus plus chemistry guy, right? If you ask, uh, you know, why, why, and this is also an Alison Armstrong quote, you know, that dorky guy at work who has a crush on you. The reason he has a crush on you is because you're acting like yourself with him. You don't even think of acting differently around him. That's what makes you attractive. So in love you, we try to dial down chemistry from 10 to seven and then amp up our compatibility from three to 10, because that's the usual relationship, white, hot chemistry, lots of friction. And that's not a good marriage. That's a roller coaster. So we, we, we flip that model around. Compatibility is everything. Chemistry, you need to have attraction. You need to have a good sex life. No one's saying otherwise. But it is, it is the icing on the cake. It's not the cake itself. So that's my two good. cents on well that. And you know, also when you're compatible and you form a heart connection, the chemistry increases. It can. And then there's what's called hedonic adaption, which is you get used to something. Right at the beginning, the first the first month, it's your new car, and eventually, it's just your car, and you've been driving it, and it's got eighty thousand miles, it's got a couple things in the door, and you don't get excited every time you get in it. It just gets you from point A to point B. So we have a hedonic adaption when we buy new homes, when we buy new cars, and also when we fall in love. And eventually, that excitement, no one, I mean, really, nobody wakes up after twenty years. Oh my God, I can't wait to hear what my husband has to say. I did, and I did. I absolutely did, but I'm sure that it's not common. You could, you could be in love, but it's, it's, we have to expect that there's going to be some sort of falling action from the peak from when you met. It dips, it changes, but I do really feel this way that when you have a heart connection, the heart connection fuels the, the, the physical chemistry. You know, it does. So, I mean, I remember right before I went on my last trip with my husband to Italy, he, we were in bed and he leaned over and he kind of bit my shoulder and he said, oh, I have so much passion for you. And this is, you know, 27 years in, but I I truly, truly believe it's the heart connection that keeps that fire burning. It does. Again, and I don't think anybody would, would disagree. I think Sometimes I feel like I have a responsibility to tell folks what a healthy marriage looks and feels like because they haven't experienced it themselves and they often doubt that they're, that, that, that thing exists, the yeah. thing that they imagine they can have. So it's, 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 it's not to say that uh, after 30 years, there's, there's 
no passion. It's that it, 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 the nature of it changes. You can go to Wikipedia, go to the biological basis of love and see Dr. Helen Fisher's work on it. Phase one, lust. Phase two, attraction. Attraction lasts for 18 to 36 months, right? And that's the dopamine and the serotonin. And eventually that levels off and you're in your last phase, which is attachment, right? It is the calm phase of love. It is the familial phase of love, which doesn't mean that there's not still joy and sex and fun. It is, it is, that's not the driving force of the marriage. And if someone says that sex is the driving force of their marriage, I definitely wonder about the quality of their marriage. Absolutely. You know, it's so funny when you keep saying familial, and I bet you've heard women say, and men too, that when they meet someone that's truly compatible with them, I've heard this thousands of times, I felt like I was home. I felt like I was in my family. I felt like I, I, I know you. I, I think that's really, I think that's, what's nice about it is that it's clarifying and it's somewhat universal. You don't need to be a person from a certain background to describe that feeling of being able to relax, let down your guard, be yourself, not worry that the next thing you say is going to cause some sort of conflagration. So I proposed to my wife after taking her to San Francisco um, to be with my mother and my sister for, for Passover, um, this 2008. And I remember, I wasn't sure. Like I said, mom, bring dad's ring. I may propose this weekend. I want the option. So bring the ring. And I just watched my wife with my mom and my sister. I was like, like just the penny dropped. I was like, oh, she's family. That's the thing that I couldn't figure out because it was so different than every other roller coaster relationship I ever had. She really was family. And so that ease, that effortlessness is the thing that sustains us more than, again, other couples might have higher highs. We don't have lows. That's the big thing. We don't have to have drag out fights. If I say something stupid, I apologize in 30 seconds, it's over. I use a little kiss your fights goodbye technique. It's really good. <laughs> Not kidding. Teach it to everybody. So good. Which, so, what technique from my book? Which the, 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 I mean, it's the whole book. I mean, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. I use one technique. You just stick. No, yeah, to, to me, that, that book, my takeaway from your book was that, that A, there's an autonomic nervous system, right? We have a fight or flight mechanism. When if you're a woman and you yell at your boyfriend, he feels attacked. He's either going to fight back or he's going to pull away. Again, this is your stuff. I'm not taking credit for it. I think it's great. All right. And then to be able to have a man listen to you or a woman, it's universal advice, right? But to have a man listen to you, you can't attack him. So you have to approach it in such a way that you provide validation at the beginning. You tell him the thing that he's doing that's making you feel upset inadvertently, right? When you do this, it makes me feel this, but you're a great boyfriend. I know you're not intending to do that. It's the way I feel. And then come up with a reasonable solution that he can buy into. That's a three-part formula that I teach in love you with your permission because I think it's so concise yes, yes, and so easy that. to understand. Yeah, you asked me if you could use that in your university. And I'm so glad you do because, you know, somebody said to me, you were put on the earth plane with the mission of connecting souls. That's all you're here for. So the conflict resolution method that I outline in that book is to help us connect and stay connected. So I'm so happy that you, you helped me in that mission, you know? Oh, I, I, it's, it's, it's really easy when you listen to others' advice that resonates with you that you could put into practice in real time. A lot of advice sounds like good advice because um, it, it, it's validating. It tells people what they want to hear. Um, you know, usually I'm right. Everybody else who disagrees with me is wrong. That's very validating to hear. Yeah. So when you take, take something that's this subtle and nuanced and you can see a real world application where since I started doing this, we fight a lot less. Well, of course we fight a lot less. You're not blaming him for being an asshole every time he does something you don't like. Exactly. That, that's going to go a long way in terms of, right? And again, it doesn't mean he's, he's perfect. I think there's, there's, a, there's a, a thing that happens in relationships where, and I coach women, so again, men may, may have the same thing. But women expect that if a guy loves me, he's going to do whatever I want, whenever I want, um, effortlessly, 
no questions asked without me even having to explain to him. Oh yeah. So it's just, he, he needs to just get, he needs to be me. And that is, that is a, a degree of difficulty that's way too far. It's good enough that he could tolerate the fact that you're different. And if you could tolerate each other, you could have a happy marriage. But if you expect the guy is going to do what you want, when you want. And, you're read, se- your, and read your mind. You're, but, you know? but the point is, it's not that he should be insensitive to your needs. It's that you're almost setting him up for failure. He will. Because no fail. one could ever do that. But oh, you said two different things. You said partly he'll read my mind, know what I want, and do it without my having to say it. Right. You know, there are. Most of us come to our adult relationships, as you know, with injuries from what I call the deformative years. <laughs> that, you know, so the first five years, the deformative years. So many people didn't have the proper attunement from their mom or their dad, where the mom kind of sensed the needs before you had language. So when we didn't get a mom or a dad who was attuned enough to sense what we needed and we couldn't say it, We come to adult relationships expecting the partner to be like the surrogate mom who would read my mind and meet my needs before I have to say them. But it's a real young, injured part of the self that even has that expectation. I never thought of that before. I think it's a really interesting notion. Yeah. And once people understand, wow, I'm just trying to fill a deficit from my deformative years, it kind of liberates them. You know, it's like, oh, wow, I'm not an infant. I do have language now. And it's not reasonable to expect my boyfriend or my partner to have boobs and be a mind reader. That only happens for us once when we're babies, you know, and before we can speak. Yeah. Again, I to quote Alison Armstrong again, I mean, she says, men are not hairy women. Uh, You just sort of expect he's going to do just like, why Why would a guy sleep with me and then like not want to be in a relationship with me? Well, just because you wouldn't do that doesn't mean he wouldn't do that. Like there's, there's this per- perpetual surprise that men and women act differently. Um, you know, when we come back in the next segment, I'd like to talk about what dating means to men and women. Before we take the break, you just reminded me of how, you know how women are often perplexed after they have sex with a guy, he withdraws. Oh, what is this? Was I just a, an F buddy? You know what I mean? Or, or is he just using me? And it turns out, it's chemically driven because you, as you know, when men have sex and they cuddle, their testosterone drops. And the only way for the testosterone to be upregulated is for them to pull away. And through the distancing, the testosterone goes up again. So it's just an attempt to regulate the chemistry. And okay. when, when women know that, right, then they're not gonna be all crazy. Oh, what is this? You're pulling away. You didn't like the sex. It helps to know how different men are. Uh, and, yeah, and, and, yeah, and, and I, I would say that certainly whatever you describe, presume, presuming the biology is there, I, 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 that's completely uh, unconscious to men. Totally. Right. It's not. It's not a strategy. I look at it on a, even a more surface level than that. Um, if we could understand, and this is uh, my wife's. She says men look for sex and find love in the process of looking for someone to sleep with. They discover, oh, I, I like her too. I didn't expect to like her because I was willing to have sex with anybody who'd have sex with me. But after hanging out with her for a month, I realized she's, she's kind of cool and she's the kind of person I want to be with. So people just get the order wrong. People think that if the guy's interested in sex, it means he's interested in you. No, it just means he's interested in sex. There's almost no correlation. Absolutely. So if you expect that sex means something, you're going to be perpetually disappointed. Sort of regardless yes. of... Exactly. And a lot of women use sex to back into a relationship thinking, well, if I give it up, oh, then he'll be in love with me or he'll right. and, and that's, that's, not, not, that's not how it works either. Not at all. Let's take a break. We'll be okay. right back for this fascinating conversation. See you in a minute. Hi, 
it's Dr. J.B. Turndorf here. Are you feeling stressed, tense, jumpy, jittery, anxious, or having panic attacks or angry outbursts or disturbed sleep? Are you worried that you or someone you love is going to get sick or even die? Are you depressed and feeling hopeless like the world is coming to an end? Or are you suffering aches and pains or stiff muscles, low energy, or falling into self-damaging or addictive behaviors like binging on junk food, the internet, or TV, or abusing drugs or alcohol, or not eating right, or exercising, feeling like, what's the point? If you said yes to any of my questions, you are likely suffering what I call the global PTSD pandemic stress syndrome triggered by the coronavirus pandemic. Don't despair. My energetic system upgrade is your rescue remedy for the panic epidemic that is plaguing our world. The energetic system upgrade has already helped some of today's top leaders. Now you can experience your own energetic system upgrade healing transformation. To find out more and to schedule your session, visit drjamieturndorf.com slash energetic system upgrade. That's Dr. Jamie Turndorf, T-U-R-N-D-O-R-F dot com slash energetic system upgrade. Love Never Dies is now on the Dream Vision 7 radio network every Wednesday and Thursday at 1 p.m. and 1 a.m. Eastern Time. Dr. Jamie Turndorf, also known as Dr. Love, is the number one international best-selling author of Love Never Dies, How to Reconnect and Make Peace with the Deceased. If you're grieving the loss of a loved one, tune in and find out how to reconnect and heal any unfinished business using Dr. Turndorf's groundbreaking new Dialoguing with the Departed technique. Visit AskDrLove.com to find out more. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow. You're listening to Love Never Dies with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. If you can't stop crying over the bodily loss of a loved one, Dr. Turndorf's number one international bestseller, Love Never Dies, How to Reconnect and Make Peace with the Deceased, will show you how to toss out the tissues and transform your grief into joy using her groundbreaking new Dialoguing with the Departed technique that enables you to reconnect and even heal unfinished business with those in spirit without the assistance of a medium, channeler, or psychic. Sign up for Dr. Love's free newsletter at AskDrLove.com and receive an exciting gift, a free excerpt of Love Never Dies. And now, back to Love Never Dies with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. Again, welcome back to Love Never Dies Radio on Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. And Dr. Turndorf, turn on the love on Binge Networks TV. And we're also streaming live on YouTube. We're talking today with Evan Mark Katz, the personal trainer for smart, strong, successful women, and the creator of Love You, his six-month video course that helps women understand and uh, find love with the men that are in their lives. So could you talk, we were talking before the break about how different men and women are in the uh, finding love department. We were saying that women think, oh, I have sex, then he'll form a relationship with me. And you were saying yeah, men, men start with sex and then maybe a relationship develops, but not necessarily. So what do you tell to your women in the love you regarding this? You said earlier in the first segment, make sure he's your boyfriend before you have sex. That's like the first thing, right? Um, I have an entire month of the course about this because it is so complicated, right? So it, it, it really parallels that month of dating, right? Month three of Love You is on dating. And in no particular order, it says, you know, the, the, the modules are called staying cool, being selective, becoming, you know, uh, becoming exclusive, um, boyfriend behavior. So what we're really doing is taking that CEO metaphor. Hey, this is my job. There's one, one position here. I'm looking for a husband. It's one position. I'm going to hold that position open as long as it takes to find someone that I could really trust with this job for the rest of my life. I get, can't have all that information in the first month, but you can gather a lot of information. You can't gather great information if you start with sex because you can't tell if he's interested in you or sex. 
So what I advocate that people do is pace things, right? See how a guy shows up. Listen to how you feel, right? See if the relationship is escalating. When he goes on a date with you, does he follow up quickly the next day to say, when can I see you again? Or does he wait a week, right? Is he making an effort to contact you in between dates? Is he seeing you more than once a week? Or is there forward momentum that's leading to strangers on the internet when everybody's swiping right and texting, right? It's a, it's a big jumble. Are we seeing this guy distinguish himself and his effort to prove that he wants the job of boyfriend? Because if he's not, if he's texting you once a week and you're hooking up once a week, there's no reason to think that that's going to change once you start having sex with him. You've just established that you're willing to have sex with the guy who's not your boyfriend. And now he's your once a week guy. And you can do that for three months and he'll still sleep with you once a week. And you're still going to wonder, I'm really falling for this guy. How come he's not my boyfriend? You established, you signed that contract to agree to those terms. So I recommend women, and again, this is awkward, but I, I mentioned it anyway, go around the bases like you're in, you're in freshman in high school, right? Employ foreplay a lot during that first month to give him the reason to come back for more, to feel desirable, to feel attractive, right? And then assess his efforts to escalate things before you A, have sex, B, become a boyfriend, and those two things are intertwined, right? So we're really giving him like essentially a, a, a four to six week audition process where he has the opportunity to claim boyfriend status if you think he's worthy, right? But, but just because a guy pressures you after two dates I want to sleep with you. I'm willing to be your boyfriend. You don't have enough information to know if he's worthy of being your boyfriend yet. And that's where the CEO hat comes on. It's not about a specific number of dates or weeks. It's a feeling that I can really trust myself and know that this is a good enough man that this isn't a mistake committing to this guy. This isn't a mistake sleeping with him. Instead of that sort of coin flip, I'm going to sleep with him because he's attractive and I've had three drinks and let's, let's sort of see what happens. I remember, like people to be in control. Remember the five parameters, right? So character, our character, kindness, kindness, consistency, consistency, communication, communication, and commitment. commitment. And in that month, you could see most of it or not. It's not guaranteed just because you have a boyfriend for a month doesn't mean he's a, he's a good husband. We've got a few years to figure that out. But you could figure out a lot from his behavior are in that first month. Are you suggesting that the five C's are present before a woman has sex with a guy? That she's very I, ne I never, I never thought about it that way, but. I think that's what you're I, saying. It's, it's sort of what I'm saying. I want to put, put a, a slight spin on it because I think that what you said is really, really good. I don't know that it could always be present because you don't know what someone's made of. The absence of it is present. So you can't always tell if a guy's truly commitment oriented. A lot of guys come on strong in that first month. Certainly the last one you can't tell. Right. And you, you have, and you haven't had too much conflict to really know how you deal with communication. But you can get a sense if something's off in that month. So it's not a promise that this boyfriend of one month is going to be there two years down the road. But if, if there's a problem, you'll notice it. That's, you know, I think that's I, more powerful. I, I always like to say... Well, you'll know a lot by how your first fight goes, right? Because if he has character and kindness, right? And I like your C's. And I think it makes sense to me, sort of being like the mom, you should have the feeling that those four at least are, he's kind. He's, he, say them again. It's so powerful, those C's. Character, character kindness. Now, Let's stop with the first. Oh, sir, I'll let you do this thing. But uh, wait, let's just wait. How does a woman see evidence of good character? What would, how would we operationalize that? What would she see? I think a lot of these things are feelings. And I think it's not that you're wrong for asking the question. I think there, there's sometimes there's an overemphasis on um, like, what question can I ask? What shit well, test can I give this guy? I don't mean that. I so, mean, how you judge a person's character it's not by what he says, but how he acts, right? right. It's, what, it's what he does. So again, I don't want to give sort of arbitrary, oh, he's mean to the waiter, therefore he's going to be mean to you. Or I, I don't want to make it that sort of one-to-one -one comparison. I think all these things we're talking about is a feeling, right? 
there's the, there's the guy who, who like guys who I, this isn't the best example but like sometimes women ask me and this is a tangent but sometimes women ask me how do you tell if a guy wants to get married right and i'll say how can you tell if a guy likes fantasy football he'll tell you you don't have to ask you don't have to wonder people will tell you they're very upfront completely upfront absolutely the absence of that a guy who never talks about commitment Probably not commitment oriented. He's telling you. Right. The absence of the conversation is what you need to know. Absolutely. So I I think it's really more paying attention to a feeling than, right, like, how do I feel? Do I feel that I can trust this guy with my mom and my baby and my bank account? It's a, it's a feeling of trust. I've never seen this person do anything wrong. My, all these years with my wife, we've had disagreements, even arguments but I would trust her with my life. There's not a question. Exactly. Right? So, and, so it's, a, it's a feeling more than a, a, a checklist. Yeah, but what I'm saying is the feeling doesn't happen in a vacuum. So you're watching. You're watching what the person says and does and listening to how you feel. Right. It, right? So the feeling doesn't just, because you can have a feeling, oh, he's wonderful, he's wonderful. And when you're enamored of someone, you can feel that way. But I want to watch what he's saying and doing and seeing if my feelings match up, you know? I, I, you know I, I, mean? love, I love what you're saying. And to add to that, I would like to, to talk about not the high, high of, oh my God, you're my soulmate. The calm feeling of the lack of anxiety, not wondering when is he going to call? When is he going to text? What is he going to say? What should I say? If you're strategizing in your head, that's not, that's not the feeling we want. We are looking for something that's fundamentally easy. And that's my North Star is relationships are easy. Absolutely. Nobody says it. I'm going to come out and plant a flag. Good relationships are easy. If your relationship takes that much work, find a better one. That's it. And you know, the thing is also little things in the beginning. If you come when you say you're going to come, and if you can't, you let me know. I'm seeing what your character is and I know how. I feel. And, that's, and that's communication, right? That's, that's having respect for someone else and being a man of your word. Um, and there's a lot of guys who make false promises, not because they're evil, but because they're selfish or whatever, right? People are selfish. They do what's right for them. And they sort of hope everybody's going to work around them. And yeah. most of my clients, the, the amazing women I work with um, are givers and they spent a the whole life dating takers. I said, hey, could you imagine what it would be like if someone ever took care of you? Not like sugar mama paid for you. Like, like, actually just took care of you emotionally and was there for you. Have you ever had that in 62 years? And they're like, no, I've taken care of my business. I've taken care of my kids. I took care of my husband. No one's ever taken care of me. I said, so that's the feeling we're going for. Someone who's taking care of you. Absolutely. So I want to make sure everybody can find you and knows how to uh, register for love you, love you. So just explain a little bit more about the program, what it entails, and, and all of that. So, because it's so important what you're doing. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Um, Love You is my, my signature course. Um, I basically w- was coaching people for over a dozen years and realized I had to take all this knowledge and put it in one place and sort of curate it and turn it into a curriculum that was easily accessible. So uh, I launched Love You in 2015, and it's... The, the tagline is give me five minutes a day, I'll give you a husband. It's not a lot of homework. It's really easy. It's about a half hour video that you get each week. You go into the site, you log in, 10 three minute YouTube looking videos. It's really simple. First month is on confidence. Once you have a baseline of confidence, we talk about meeting men. Now you're meeting men. We talk about dating, that process that Jamie and I were just talking about. Now you have a boyfriend, understanding men, relationships, commitment. So we walk you through this entire process and people who want to be a part of it, fill out, watch a video on my website. Top of the page, it says, you know, watch free video. Give me your email address, watch the free video. At the end of the video, if you like what you hear, fill out an application. It's a long application. I have a process where I only want to work with women who are really, really dedicated to this. My goal is not to, to work with billions of people. My goal is to work with dedicated women who want to prioritize love because you have everything except for the one thing you want most. My clients are the woman who has everything but the guy. So you fill out this application, you book a call to talk to me, we'll spend an hour on the phone just talking like this, I'll get to know you. And at the end of the call, if I think you're a good fit for coaching, we'll enroll you into this course. And it's a six month curriculum. 
private Facebook group with hundreds of women who've gone through the course and group coaching calls, about 25 women across the top of the screen, two hours every Tuesday night doing a live Q&A, answering questions. So it's really a, a community experience. And if you feel alone in this process, uh, because dating's never worked for you and your friends are married, that's, it's, you're, 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 you're part of a group of people who are all solving this problem and you get to witness up close what happens when you apply these principles that uh, Dr. Turngroff and I are talking about today, operating from a place of confidence and abundance and understanding and making slightly different choices that produce big results. So that's, that's it. My name is Evan Mark Katz. You go to evanmarkkatz.com and either take the quiz on the homepage or go to evanmarkkatz.com forward slash dating and uh, put in your name and email address and we'll send you some free stuff and you can see if you like it. And have you ever attended any weddings of the women who have gone through your program? So I am, um, if you go to, go to my website, I encourage it. It's a really cool website. I'm like, most people like don't care about their website. My website is like my house. So I put a lot of thought into my website. I've got a thousand blog posts, 200 podcasts. It's a repository for free dating advice. Um, at the top of the page, there's a, there's a, there's a, a menu. It says love stories. So I've got a hundred wedding photos that are on the page, but here's, here's the, the kicker. When you're the dating coach, who gives them the nudge in the right direction, right? Gives them the first six months and helps them find boyfriends. Three years later, you don't get invited to many weddings. A, because they're not thinking of you. B, they don't always want to tell their husband they had a dating coach. So I tend to get a lot of wedding photos, but I do not go to many weddings. I am more than open. I would attend weddings, but a lot of people keep me as a secret and I understand. Yeah, I was just thinking we might have to give you that what is that privilege where you could you become a, a, a minister so you can marry people or what, what oh no no I already have that I'm a minister of the Universal Life Church and uh, I've I've uh, officiated my sister's wedding and I do have a former client who's getting married next summer and I'll be officiating her wedding well, that's very happen. very very rare I do not I, I don't do this for for that glory I, I the nice part is getting all those emails from people who say, hey, you helped me raise my standards for what I should expect from men. And I tell women, and again, sorry for the male listeners, I believe only 10% of men are good husband material. Doesn't mean that all the other guys are bad guys, but the capacity to really make a woman happy, character, kindness, consistency, right? plus you know, attraction and a personality. Stop with this finger, character, kindness, consistency. <laughs> <laughs> so- what, what I basically say is, hey, if we could establish your experience is real and 90% of guys who write to you are a waste of your time, that means there's 10% of guys who are worth your time. We have to explore how to get those 10% to really connect with you. And that's my job. That's wonderful. I love what you're doing. It's a beautiful mission. I'm glad you connected with me again. It's been a while. Keep in touch with me. Let, you, let me know how you're doing. And any new products that you want to promote, just ask me and you'll come on back. I'm, I'm doing love you until the day I die. I found, my, I found my calling and I'm just really honored that I get to have such close relationships with women and hold their hand like, like you know, I'm like the Sherpa and I'm taking, up, taking them up to the top of Mount Everest and they don't think they could do it. But if, they, if, they, if you could follow directions, you could do right here. Yes. So I'm going to say not goodbye, but so long. And happy love trails. Happy love trails to you, Dr. Turndorf. Thank you so much for having me back. So happy. See you later. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow.